meetings on Yvonne's staff for Science for the Public, and I welcome you to our Contemporary Science Issues and Innovations program. Today, we consider how deep sea mining threatens the marine microbial ecosystems that provide the foundation for all other ocean life. Such an extensive threat to marine life is also a threat to the planet. Julie Huber is a senior scientist in marine chemistry and geochemistry at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And Beth Orcott is vice president for research and senior research scientist in geomicrobiology at the Big Low Laboratory for Ocean Sciences. Both are experts on microbial life below the seafloor. Julie Huber and Beth Orcott, thank you very much for joining us and a big welcome. Thanks. Thank you. And if I can get a little background here, the microbes in general are not a familiar topic uh, for the general public. We don't get a lot of information about that. And certainly we don't hear a lot about deep sea microbes, how important they are. So Julie, could you start us off with some background? What are they? Why are they important? Sure. Well, Beth and I both study microbes in the ocean. And by microbes, I mean single-celled organisms. Uh, they fill most of the diversity of life on our planet because they've been around for a really, really long time. <laughs> uh, and they're everywhere in the environment, in our bodies, and they're very important for human health, obviously. But they're also really important for our planet's health. And in the ocean, they do a lot of amazing things. They transform carbon. They transform a lot of different chemicals like nitrogen and sulfur and things like that. And in the deep ocean, they serve some really novel roles, especially in the darkest, deepest parts of the ocean that Beth and I study, where in many cases, they form the base of the food chain. So whereas up here in the land, uh, on the continents, we think about trees mm -hmm, as the primary mm -hmm. producers or plants getting energy from the sun. But in the dark ocean, there's no sunlight. And so these microbes are extracting energy from chemical reactions occurring with oceanic crust. And, and, and you mentioned that they are the basis of the whole nutri nutrient system for all life in the ocean. So this is a really critical thing, and I we're seeing a lot more, well, some more information in the general media, and I think we'll hear more about it. Now, there is this issue of deep sea mining. So, uh, Beth, what is that about? What are they after with deep sea mining? And uh, what's the risk there? Yeah, uh, there's a lot to unpack. There. Yes. <laughs> so, deep sea mining is the idea that um, there are uh, metals and critical minerals that are uh, attached to rocks on the seafloor. Um, some of them are part of rocks that were formed mm -hmm. um, uh, from mid at mid-ocean ridges where you have hydrothermal vents, uh, and some of them have been precipitating out of the water over a long time. These are things like cobalt, uh, nickel, things that uh, our human society is interested in getting more quantities of for various technologies. And there's an idea that maybe getting them from the deep ocean is um, a, a, a something to consider. So the idea would be, imagine like a big bulldozer going onto the seafloor mm -hmm. to collect those rocks or scrape those rocks um, and then pumping them up a pipe to a ship uh, and then bringing them back to land to process them for the metal content and the critical minerals. Right. One thing is these minerals are very, some of these minerals are especially important for things like our phones and all the, the, uh, the, the tech that is so important right now as we make a transition away from uh, fossil fuels and things and uh, uh, the, the energy and so on, that, uh, I think. And then another thing is you say they're going to be scooping, I guess, these rock formations with the chemicals. Will they be drilling also? Uh, for some of the mineral okay. resource types, um, they are below the seafloor. So you would need to excavate into the, the seabed to get them. You wouldn't necessarily use drilling like okay. you might imagine for oil drilling. Okay. It's a different technology. Okay. 
Drilling might be needed for other industries, but it's not needed for deep sea mining. Okay, so we're talking mostly scooping things. Right, more like how mining occurs on land. Okay, excavation, right, right, big right. Mining right. pits. How about explosions? No, on, my, on land we do that. Right, right. so uh, no. that wouldn't be the concept Okay, here. but what they're doing, how does this disrupt then when they go through to pick up these rock type things and uh, other ways, other sources of the minerals, what's it doing to the, these microsystems? Well, I can maybe talk about some of it and Julie can talk yeah, about okay. the hydrothermal vent systems that she's more familiar with. So there's three different types of resources that we might go after. Uh, and one of them are little rocks about the size of a potato, about the size of my fist, that are on the seafloor. Um, animals are attached to them. Very large areas. We're talking very, very large areas where these exist. Um, and the idea would be you kind of bulldoze along mm. and scrape those up. Um, and any given uh, contractor might be trying to mine an area the size of Munich, wow. uh, a city size of area every year to be economically viable. Um, that's one resource type. And those resources are inter uh, of interest because of the cobalt and the nickel mm -hmm. in them. And mm -hmm. they're, they're sitting on top sediment mm -hmm. as well. Right, yeah. right, right. So that's going to get messed up as they go along. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Maybe pull up the, one of those images and we can show. Um, the second resource type is found on underwater mountains. Yeah, the, the vents. Seamounts. Sea mounts. Sea mounts. Oh, sea Not okay. quite at hydrothermal vents, okay. but at these underwater okay. mountains okay. called seamounts. Gotcha. Uh, where the rocks that are exposed have a lot of these minerals attached to them. There you would, it would be more like dredging. So you'd be trying to rip those rocks off the side of the mountain um, uh, and collect them. And then the third type are these hydrothermal vent type deposits. And so I'll let Julie right. talk and about so that. And so most of those are associated with where tectonic plates are spreading apart or right. sliding under one another or things like that. And you get these sulfide structures. Uh, and those sulfide structures are packed full of these, of these minerals. Uh, so there's active hydrothermal systems, but there's also yeah. inactive yeah. hydrothermal uh, vents. And so both of those are of interest to the deep sea mining industry. Uh, and in that case, it would be just plowing them down. Uh, you know, sort of like chopping down a tree. Right. And uh, sulfide structures can grow, you know, 20, 30, 40 meters tall, uh, quite tall. Uh, and I, I will say we should also be clear that there's currently no deep sea mining going on in the ocean. There have been tests, right, and that's yes. why we have a sense of right. how this would happen. Right, right. But there is no mining going on right, right at this moment. Right. I think you have both pointed out also that this area, in terms of understanding these microbial ecosystems that are so fundamental, there's not a whole lot of work done on that either. This is very deep sea stuff, right? Could you just tell us very quickly a little bit about that? Why don't they know a lot about it? <laughs> well, it's, I mean, hydrothermal vents are a perfect example. We yeah. didn't find them until 1977. Ex yes. Uh, and it's really in the last 20 years that we've had increased access to the deep ocean through better technology, better underwater volcano or underwater vehicles, excuse right, me, right. better maps of the deep ocean. Yes. But we do know at deep sea hydrothermal vents, they're actually the most well studied in comparison to these other ah, ecosystems I that see. Beth referred to. I see. Because you have these amazing deep sea creatures that we don't see anywhere where uh, else yes. in the ocean, and we know that they are reliant on those microbes to grow. A little more on that, please, yeah. because I think, well, there have been plenty of images, National Geographic and yeah. NOVA and everything else have provided images because it is such a shock at that depth and that pressure and that heat to see shellfish <laughs> walking yeah. around. And it's amazing, but they all depend on these microbial systems. Can we get a little more on that? Yeah, so those giant tube worms or those big clams, they're actually stuffed full of bacteria. And what those bacteria are doing is they're taking uh, chemicals from the volcanic fluids leaking out, most commonly hydrogen sulfide, which smells like rotten eggs, uh, and they're combining that with oxygen and producing carbon. Uh, and basically the tube worm is feeding off of that carbon. And this is called chemosynthetic ecosystems. So it's actually remarkably well studied 
because yeah, it was crazy when scientists first yeah, found felt, it, and yeah. they needed to know how is this possible. Right. Um, the other ecosystems that, that Beth is talking about, the manganese nodules, the seamount cobalt crust, we actually know much less about the role of microbes in those ecosystems. We're just kind of getting to that discovery level. Right. Um, and so with the urgency of deep sea mining, we argue they need a lot more study. Uh, right, uh, and, and again, it's because it's so remote, so deep, you need the, the special equipment to get down there. Uh, you can't just dive down and take a look, right? Correct, yeah, no, we're talking two to three miles below Thank the sea Thank you, surface. yes. Yeah. Um, way too far for scuba diving, so you need to use subs or robots. The robotic boats or whatever they are, the subs. Yeah. <laughs> right. And, uh, you know, we humanity has only maybe seen 1% of our seafloor, so there's so much left down there to discover. Um, I was uh, fortunate enough to be part of a team, for instance. We visited an underwater mountain looking for a certain type of feature, and we were surprised to discover that there was an octopus nursery at oh, this so underwater at mountain. That depth? Yes, and um, uh, so as Julie was talking about, one of our big questions is, what is their uh, food source? What are oh. what are the connections to microbes in these types right, of deep sea right, ecosystems? Right. And it was a good reminder to us that sometimes you'll find new things that you weren't expecting. And so that's some of the concern from the scientific right. community about this potential new industry is that we write damage these habitats before we even learn how they function. Right. Now, would it be fair to say that this is not just a local issue, these, you, these little habitats as you go along, uh, the mounts or the uh, or anything that you're looking at, but that it might affect life in the sea broadly? Because everything depends on microbes in the end. Right. Well, and if you collectively look at all the types okay. of habitats that are potentially being targeted. You have all of the mid-ocean ridges. You have these large swaths of the Pacific Ocean uh, where these manganese nodules are. Uh, and then, what are there, tens of thousands of seamounts in the ocean? At least. At least, I mean, yeah, again, right. without very good maps. Right. Right. Uh, about 30% of the deep sea has been mapped at high resolution now, which actually is a really big accomplishment. Right. And I, th I would add one more thing, is yeah. that what we've been talking about is focusing on the sea floor. Yes. But there's also going to be a presence of this industry in the water and at the surface. <laughs> and so there's concerns that also there might be disturbances in the water column. Yes. Uh, uh, particles, yes. maybe metals that will influence migratory species the health of the water ecosystems, yeah. um, as well as the noise might yes. be something yeah. that is problematic right. and needs to be thought, uh, we need to be thoughtful about those impacts. Right, so you're really still just learning a lot about this. We know it's fundamental. And then you have this urgency now because of this pressure for deep sea mining and that we tend to hear, don't worry, everything will be okay. And I actually heard that from <laughs> you know, a few times uh, that, the, that we can do the deep sea mining, don't worry about it. Uh, but I think you, you're onto it here, you need to worry about it, okay. Is there any ecosystem or are there any ecosystems that are particularly vulnerable that if they go also there would be a triggering effect that you could name uh, offhand or is that not an issue yet? That is, are there specific ones you're really worried about or maybe they don't know yet? Well, I would argue that we know a lot about the animals at these deep sea hydrothermal vents. And we know, for example, those beautiful tube worms, they're yes. only found at certain vents in one part of the Pacific. They're not found in the oh, Atlantic I didn't Ocean. Know that. And some biologists have argued that each individual vent field, which might only be the size of like a football field, yeah. there are unique, and we call them endemic, right? They're only found at that yeah, place that yeah. we know of so far. So if you were to wipe out the sulfide structures and you know these animal communities, they might have nowhere they might have nowhere else to go. Right. Right. They might Become go extinct. extinct. Right. Um, and that is actually scientists have recognized this for a while and put out a call to not mine active hydrothermal systems. And this has been one of the the main reasons because we don't know enough right. about 
the distribution of the animals, but what we do know tells us they are very unique location by location. Yes, that's, that's really important, especially at a time when we are uh, extinguishing <laughs> species left and right. And so we have this terrible problem, and one of the problems is you get X, then that triggers Y. That is, you know, you, you, you extinguish one species and that has an effect on others, and that's a problem yeah, too, I imagine, but also just because they're so unique. Yeah, and these, these microbes are, and animals, they're just, they're, they're linked to the underlying rock and the water moving ah, yes. through that rock. It's not like they're floating through the water column yes. and can just, yes. that's not their lifestyle, right? right? They, they live on the seafloor and associated with these rocks and minerals. And so if you remove the place where they live and their access to the volcanic fluids, you know, it, they can't go live somewhere else. Right, right. And thank you for the other point of that. It, it's not just local. The damage isn't just local necessarily. It will disrupt from whatever they're spewing all over the place uh, as they go. And we have enough problems with that now with plastics and uh, these other things in the in the seawater, but that this could have a very widespread effect. You're over here on this side, but it could damage areas far, far away, much like toxins and so on in the uh, uh, affecting the atmosphere here and rivers and everything else. Is it, in your view, absolutely necessary? This is what we're hearing all the time. Oh, we have to do this deep sea mining uh, because the chemicals are, the minerals that we need are down there and there are plenty of them. But there's another argument surfacing now that no, we don't need to be doing this actually. Is this part of your work? Do you know anything about it? Uh, it's not part of my direct, uh, our direct work as microbiologists, but it is something we think about in the context of um, all the projections of how many critical minerals we will need assume certain technologies, right? And if we invest in technologies that are less metal intensive, for example, uh, for instance, there's batteries being proposed that use less metals, then the demand might not be as high as projected for driving this. Likewise, if we as consumers um, want to have more recycling of the metals we already have in our economy, uh, then that would diminish the need for getting them from the deep sea. Um, uh, and so it's really on those kind of economic and technological levels of whether or not those drivers really exist. We also need to think about the social um, acceptance mm -hmm. of deep sea metals mm -hmm. and that um, companies may see that they don't want to have deep sea metals in their supply chain because it can't be shown to be environmentally social and governance goals, ESG investing, right, is a buzzword. <laughs> um, and so we are already seeing some companies and industries kind of being ahead and saying, we won't accept these until it can be shown to be sustainable. Mm -hmm. And it's not clear that that is true, right? Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's not that these metals come back. Yeah, this is right. They don't revive very quickly. Uh, yeah. Right. Thank you for that. And that brings us to what about controls in terms of government agencies, the UN agencies, and so on. Can you give us some background about that? Who's looking at this? Who will govern this? Well, I'm going to hand it over to Beth for the details, but it is important for people to understand some of these resources exist within the exclusive economic zones of a lot of different countries around mm -hmm, the globe, mm -hmm. and they have a lot of control over that, but the bulk of them exist outside of exclusive economic zones. Okay. They exist on what we call the high seas. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Yeah. thanks for that, Julie. So in that high seas area, um, which is most of the ocean, mm -hmm. uh, where no country is in charge, um, as part of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, there was um, part of that convention was the idea that mineral resources in that international space should be uh, managed by a UN-based authority. It's called the International Seabed Authority. And their remit is to manage those resources for the common benefit of all humanity, which means now and in the future, mm -hmm. uh, and also to ensure the effective protection of the environment related to mineral resource use. 
You got to remember, there's a lot of other uses of the ocean. There's right, fisheries, right, there's right, seabed right, cables, right, right. there's all kinds of users out there, as well as people who have cultural connection to mm -hmm, those mm -hmm. places. Um, so if we just focus on that one particular UN agency, the International Seabed Authority, it's their job to try to come up with rules. And how is that done? That's done in the same way that other United Nations efforts are. All the different member countries are part of developing that, the mining code. Um, and so that um, states and contractors can put forth a proposal to go and exploit those resources. Okay, so hypothetically, <laughs> or, or we could say, that, well, there is something, there's a, 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 a governance in place, but not everybody signs on. Not all members of the UN sign on. The United States has been a little notorious about not signing on things like climate change uh, efforts and so on. Is that a problem? That if you, or do most countries sign on to this? Uh, yeah, that's a really interesting uh, deep dive if we want to go there. Um, so the, UN, the United States is not a signatory to the law of the sea. What that means is we don't have a seat at the table with making the rules. We can offer advice uh, through our delegations there. Um, it also means that U.S.-sponsored contractors can't request to go into those international oh, waters. Oh, you say cannot request, so they would ha they are still restricted in the sense they have to request. I, I was thinking, could they just go? No, Do you know? no, but they because can't. Because it's not uh, the waters okay. don't belong to the United States. Good. Right? Thank you. Thank you very much for that. So that's a small relief there, right? <laughs> Tempor temporary relief. But do most of the United Nations uh, countries uh, are most of them uh, committed to this? Most of the countries in the United Nations are signatories to this, okay. and so part of the International Seabed Authority okay. Assembly. All right. So they are in the process of setting up the regulations at this time. Correct. When do you think the regulations would be in effect? <laughs> Sorry, I asked that question. <laughs> I'll try it again. <laughs> when <laughs> will the regulations be uh, imposed? It's a hot topic. Um, <laughs> if you've been following this at all lately, you'll know that this process has been going on for uh, several years. And about two years ago, um, one country invoked kind of a technicality in the rules to say, basically, two years from now, you should be able to allow us to put forth uh, um, applications for okay. exploitation. And they should be evaluated based on whatever the rules are at that time. Um, which is kind of an interesting um, legal clause, and there's a yeah, lot of debate about what, yeah. what is the legality of, um, what is the obligation of the international seabed authorities and the members of those to address that. But it has put the conversation into hyperdrive. Yep. Uh, more meetings, longer meetings, a lot going on for these delegations to try to come up with this mining code. They, some people, uh, think that it could be possible that the mining code is approved in the next meeting, which happens in July. There are others who say a lot more time is needed to come up with effective regulation. Um, I don't have a crystal ball. Right, I can't tell right, you when it's going right, to happen. Right, right, right. It's a, it, but it's problematic because of the, the, the tension uh, between the pressure to get on with this mining and the other end of it that this will be so disruptive we may not be able to fix it if we right. start and, disrupting. And as Beth said, the International Seabed Authority is supposed to be doing two things, the regulations and the protection. And uh, you have to do them together. Mm -hmm. And they are not moving at the same oh, pace oh, from what oh. we have seen. And I think Microbial Ecosystem Service is a great example where yeah. that wasn't even a word commonly used. Uh, in thinking about microbes in the ocean. And so we've been working, for example, to try to get some of that language in there. Here is what you should measure to think about what this disturbance would look like to a microbial community and how that might impact carbon flux, nitrogen flux, yeah, things like that, right. animal settling. Um, and that is, I feel, behind 
uh, compared to the other regulations. And there's been several scientific papers uh, and uh, other things in the last year or so basically putting out that framework. How much more time is needed yeah. to get, to get yes. effective baselines to understand if you would cause harm or not cause harm? Right. Many of the people that serve on these uh, organizations are not scientists, I think, right? Uh, so it's like dealing with Parliament. Oh, give it a try, <laughs> or Congress. <laughs> you know that you see clearly that if scientists are trying to explain something like this, uh, it, you go blank. Do they have that problem with the UN group in this case, or are there people on these not committees? But you know these meetings that uh, are are representing the scientists? Uh, that's a fun question. Uh, the Every delegation, that uh, nation delegation that is in the International Seabed Authority, um, they might have different expertise yeah. that they're bringing to the table. So some countries do have in-country experts that can help them with understanding what they're drafting. Other countries may lack those resources. Um, uh, but in particular, or, there's no like, formal space yeah. for science in those conversations, Whoa. only via the nations if they bring that. Uh, so I have had the opportunity to serve on a, an observer delegation that represents scientists to say, we want to try to engage in this process and provide the best scientific understanding to the delegations to help them understand where the concerns might be. Yeah. Um, but that's a, a voluntary effort. It's not part of the the Seabed Authority itself. It's a little worrisome because I could just see armies of lawyers out there, you know, for representing the mining We have lawyers who sit with us as well okay, but, to and help they can, us. I mean, we're trained as right, oceanographers. Exactly, exactly, right? exactly. exactly. Uh, and, and social scientists, right, economists. Right, it's right, a right. very complicated landscape. Okay. You, you don't, you can't just have lawyers and yeah, scientists, right? I understand right? That. You need... Right. To look at the whole picture. Exactly. Yeah. Understood. But it's just that you need the science in there. And it's Absolutely. hard for a lot of people to fathom this, this stuff. It's bad enough with the public, you know. Before we end, I need to ask you about your COBRA mm -hmm. the project. Would you mind telling us about this? This is to address the problem? OK. We just have a few minutes left, so I would like to get some information about it. Yeah, so Julie and I uh, co-direct a program that was funded by the U.S. National Science Foundation called the Crustal Ocean Biosphere <laughs> Research Accelerator, which we Glad call they COBRA. they call it COBRA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, the whole goal of this is to try to bring uh, together diverse stakeholders to try to accelerate research to address these knowledge gaps that we've talked about. Much needed. And try to translate that information for policymakers. Um, and especially also try to bring up a new generation of uh, early career scientists from across the globe to be engaged in these efforts. Because there's going to be more and more interest yeah, of industry yeah, yeah. in getting into the deep yes, sea. Yeah. And so we need more people doing deep sea science to help inform those things. And we need to train scientist, yeah. how to engage in these conversations. Um, and uh, so that's the goal of our program. Um, uh, and yeah, we do all kinds of things for our scientific community to help them in that regard. Uh, what do, do you like, uh, you do papers probably and so on, but and do you meet with like mining companies or anything like that or governments uh, to try to uh, provide the information? Is that Working with our partners, um, yes. that's something that scientists affiliated with COBRA would do. Okay. Um, and then one of the things we do is offer monthly webinars that are online. Anybody can join them. Uh, yes, we'll um, put this on the... Yeah, yeah. great. Uh, you can find it all at cobra.bigelow.org. Okay. Anybody's welcome to come. They're free. And we try to talk about these topics. Right. And they're all recorded and available on um, the internet, so you can watch them later. Thank you. We'll make sure that link is on there okay. and that we publicize that for you. That is really very helpful. Is there anything else before we shut down here that you uh, would like to add? I, I just think it's really important for people to think about the ocean. Please. Really broadly. <laughs> you know, yes. I, I think the deep sea, out of sight, out of mind. 
Uh, but every part of the ocean is touched by human activity. And so to think about what, right. whatever it is happening, whether it's climate change or deep sea mining or if you're going to use a compostable spoon, to, to think about what is happening in the ocean. Right. Well, the other thing is with the microbial systems in the ocean, the whole planet in the end, I think, depends on this. The oceans are vital for the planet and the microbial systems are really fundamental. Is that correct? Sure. You want to just underscore that. Anything else? Yeah, I would, I would definitely underscore that. Microbes are the heroes here. Yes. Yay, microbes. <laughs> right, right, right. Hope that people understand and appreciate these little invisible things yes. <laughs> that sustain us all. Thank you both so much for giving your time and expertise. I wish you the very best. Uh, and in a hurry, I wish yeah. <laughs> it. <laughs> Thank you very Great. much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.